Truth Frequency Radio Network. KTFRN. Worldwide. Shadowland Voyagers, in the spirit of sovereignty and self-empowerment, we invite you to journey with us into the Shadowland. Let's rediscover, reclaim, and integrate the fragmented aspects of our individual and collectively held consciousness. Realize true freedom and restore authentic expression. Could it be the only way out is through the Shadowland? Good evening, Shadowland Voyagers. This is Sienna Lea, and I'm here with my co-host, Christina Grant, tonight. Good evening, everyone. This is Episode 26, Myth, Shadow, and Evolution, with Rebecca Zagani. Good I'm evening, here. everyone. Yes, good Rebecca. evening, Rebecca. All right, I'm going to give a little read of who you are so that our listeners can begin synergizing with your incredible being. And your, we're going to have an amazing show, you all. This is a dear friend of mine that has absolutely groundbreaking information that has she's worked on for many, many years. Rebecca Degani is the co-creator with her partner and artist, James Berthron, of Venus and Her Lover. Reinventing the Myth, a Tantra Art Project. This project includes a book of art and poetry, the pillow book of Venus and her lover, a memoir of how the art was created, soon to be out, and a tantric oracle and erotic card deck, the pillow deck. Becca has written poetry and prose all her life. For eight years, she worked as publisher and contributor for the avant-garde literary magazine, The Writer's Cramp. She has written copy for newspapers in the service of environmental activism and travel articles for the magazine International Living. Excerpts from Venus and her lover have appeared in the magazine's Magical Blend, the Beltane Papers, and the blog Holy Waters. As a teenager living in a Greek village, Becca would wonder about the mythological characters in the nighttime sky, what forces of nature might be behind the stories. Her lifelong spiritual quest has led her to apprentice under Christian ministers, a Hindu Brahmin, a Native American shaman, Buddhist nun, and an Indian yogi. In turn, she has taught meditation and led workshops in the healing arts. Through her living abroad and world travels, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and she has had first-hand experience with several spiritual traditions, Becca gained insight into the psychological impetus behind mythology, the social roles of the feminine and the masculine, and the cultural expressions of relationship. Good evening, Rebecca. Good evening. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Well, it is a deep honor to have you here. This is a subject that is incredibly dear to my heart. I also worked for many years with the archetypes with my spiritual mentor, Asha Love, and I recognize the huge power that we have in myth and archetypal realities that most of us have no idea what they even are. So I have been guided to get down to the basics here and ask you to begin at the beginning with talking about myth. And what is myth? What are archetypes? What realm have you been working in? And how did you get there? How did 
how did this area of reality open up to you? That's about five questions. So yeah, <laughs> take it wherever you wish to take it. Well, I guess we'll start with uh, definitions. The archetypes, we can look at it in two different ways. Carl Jung is who brought to the fore the idea of primordial images or motifs that were common to all cultures. And he saw them as like prototypes, gods, goddesses, mana, spirits, that were dwelling in the collective unconscious. And it was interesting to him that no matter what culture he went into, there they were. Of course, they expressed themselves in uh, different cultural ways. But there was always the mother, the hero, the warrior, the trickster. And, of course, Joseph Campbell did a lot of work bringing comparative mythology into the public awareness. So there's that idea that archetypes are common motifs in the collective unconscious. But where I really like to focus and where James, my partner, and I have really felt archetypes. Yes, there's the collective motifs. And also there's, um, I guess you'd call them subtle organizing energy fields. And now I have to talk a little bit about physics. When we look at the zero point energy field, yes. or the, the Buddhists called it the void, uh, New Agers call it the one, Greg Braden called it the divine matrix, the all that is. And we imagine that it's a world of vibration. Where these vibrations intersect or maybe create little nodules or where they coalesce is prior to coming into our 3D world of reality. So these subtle organizing energy fields have the vibration of what we might call the archetypes, the creator or creatrix, the destroyer, the maintainer, the trickster, and so forth. And according to physics, the subtle organizing energy fields exist below the speed of light. And when they start coming into our world, like Rupert Sheldrake, he was an English biochemist, he put out the theory of morphic resonance. And he said that there's a morphic field that then it's held in the noosphere, the, the realm of ideas. And as it gets denser, it appears in 3D reality. So this thing, let's call it the mother archetype, which could be the idea of creation, the idea of sustenance, the idea of nurturing, then steps down into our reality and appears to us, well, actually, the mother archetype is common to everybody born on the planet, and then it gets reinforced by repeated actions and thoughts. We all have feelings about our mother. We all have feelings about the mother. We all have feelings about the earth. The earth holds that vibration of the mother. So how then it gets interpreted in cultures, then we get, oh, this is Shakti, this is Hera, this is, you know, the different mother archetypes in the different mythologies. So that's where James and I were led with Venus and her lover. Because we sensed that there was something behind the curtain, you know, there was something moving thing that wasn't entirely, well, it certainly wasn't our will many times. We felt that we were on the receiving end of things. So we stumbled into Venus and her lover, stumbled into invoking archetypes, which, by the way, I don't recommend <laughs> doing it unconsciously. Why is that, uh, why is that, Rebecca? Well, let's look at the unconscious invoking of an archetype we have in our society now, which is God, the punishing father, God, the avenger. So that archetype is invoked continually on a daily basis on planet Earth by people who don't really, they think it's, oh, yeah, maybe it's a loving father, maybe it's, but God is going to punish me if I don't do it right. So that whole invocation, which is continual on the planet, is invokes war. So for people who say, oh, that mythology doesn't exist, in fact, when we say, oh, it's just a myth, it's a way of saying it's not true, we are all living our myths. So if we are unconscious, then those who, say, might have uh, an interest in manipulating human energy can come right in on that unconscious invocation, unconscious invocation. So that's what's happening on planet Earth with, for example, God the Avenger. 
God the one who's going to punish you. So when we started and on, now I'll go and answer your other four questions. Okay. Um, it, well, is that clear, the archetype definition that I just put out? Uh, I have a lot more questions, but but go ahead and um, run with this uh, where you want to take it. And then if it still is unclear, we can uh, break it down a little bit later. But I want to hear more what you have to say. Yeah, you're painting a very nice background. Okay, so given that that's what they are, imagine James and me, this uh, innocent couple, newly in love, uh, in our relationship. And uh, he's an artist, I'm a writer, and he gets the inspiration to paint me. And since we had committed to a tantric sexual relationship, he was very inspired about that and wanted to express that in his art. And uh, he said, will you be my muse? I'm like, sure. Because his art was pretty, uh, like, slash and splash. You know, I I was sure that Whatever he painted, it would like be some squiggly lines and some circles, and yeah, that would be wonderful. So he says, well, I'd like to do it based on photography. I said, okay, fine. So we brought, started to bring a camera into our lovemaking sessions, which was pretty um, odd, you know, trying to hold a camera <laughs> and put it on a tripod. Anyway, that wasn't working so well. So then he said, you know, I really want, I need, we need a photographer, in our lovemaking sessions, which, of course, at that point, I just said, well, no, forget it. Uh, But he'd already uh, started doing some paintings, and uh, to my surprise, they were coming out in photorealistic style, which he does not paint that way. So um, here's an example of us invoking something. We didn't know what it was, but it was already sort of taking the the brush in his hand. Anyway, we start doing uh, photography with a girlfriend, a mutual friend who was very professional about shooting the pictures. And then we would get the pictures back and then he would select images and start painting them. And uh, I mean, first I had to get over the fact that you could tell it was me (laughs) in the pictures. It was him and me because it was photorealism that he was painting. And then uh, when the first painting started hanging on my wall, I was getting these feelings off of them. And I mean, I'm naturally a poet, so it's not so strange that I was writing poetry, but poetry started flowing onto the page. And then I would look and they were messages and they were messages about, uh, I would say, archetypal woman and archetypal man. They weren't my ideas per se. I agreed with them, but I could recognize that they were coming from someplace very deep. So uh, we then came to realize that we had unconsciously invoked Venus, the goddess of love, um, which was Aphrodite in uh, Greek, mythology, Venus in Roman mythology, and Mars, who is the warrior, who was Ares in Greek mythology. When we took a look at it, we realized, oh my, of course that's, uh, of course we would. I mean, I, in my astrological chart, have nine aspects ruled by Venus, nine out of 12. And my whole life has been this champion of love and devotee of relationship and and enjoying erotic expression. Whereas James was uh, born with birth defects. He's been handicapped his whole life. He had to struggle from his first breath. He had 20 operations before he was two. He couldn't walk. You know, his whole life has been fighting for what most people would consider normal, being able to talk, being able to walk. So um, naturally, he is a warrior, a good channeler of the warrior archetype. And naturally, it's natural for me to channel the the love goddess. And at the beginning, it was so magical and amazing. Like, wow, look at at this. Because we could feel that it was the, and that's the thing, the messages that were coming through were not about old Venus and old Mars. They were about a new kind of warrior, 
a warrior who fights the battle within, who faces his shadow, who incorporate who becomes a whole man and the new lover the new goddess of love the messages coming through about venus were uh, about a universal love you know way beyond uh possessiveness and jealousy and um lack of self-confidence and vanity and all those things that venus and aphrodite had in the myths were clearly being repudiated so the first year was was very magical, all kinds of synchronicities and uh, amazing events, and the, the art was just shimmering, it seemed to me, and the messages were leaving us speechless. So we were living in the Caribbean at the time, which is pretty easy to have a magical experience there anyway, and we these paintings were being produced. I was writing poetry, and we were keeping them pretty quiet because the art was erotic we're living in a you know catholic society uh in the caribbean and yet word got out and we we started getting a lot of judgment by people of course who had never seen it but just the idea that we were doing sexual work was because you know was um shocking to people and why would it be shocking to people? Because we all have shadows in our sexuality, and the fact that we and we were obviously uh, happy, and our relationship was happy, and we were uh, very thrilled with our creative output. So um, after three years in the Caribbean, getting judgment, and we really became pariahs in our town, and this is by people's projections onto us. You know, there was rumors we were having orgies, which wasn't so, that there were, we were sexual deviants, which we were just sexual, period. (laughs) So, uh, after three years, we got a clear message that we needed to take the work out of there. Now, for me, this was, I mean, I had lived there 17 years. My son was born there. I was totally set up. You know, I had income, uh, property. I owned my house, living on the beach. This, to get this kind of directive, and it came pretty clearly, like, you have to go, was when I was facing, James and I were both facing all right, we by then were feeling that there were archetypal forces that we had invoked that were guiding us. And we were checking in with them on a constant basis and feeling that they were benevolent and that and helping raise our uh, viewpoint, raise our awareness. So we said, okay, we can't afford to just move somewhere, but if we sold everything we could. So we did sold everything, the cars, the houses, the property, and then we moved to Europe. And we, we, uh, I did a meditation <clears throat> and basically just stuck my finger down on a map of Europe, and we went to Italy and lived in Tuscany, and we lived in a Tuscan village there uh, for three years, which was um, an amazing for me. I really could get serious about my writing for my first the first time in my life because I had some money. I homeschooled my son. Uh, James had a studio, and this was, after all, where Venus and Mars had been uh, real uh-huh. in ancient times. So I could walk the lands where their temples were. We made a pilgrimage to Greece and to Crete while we were there to really get a feel for what goddess culture was, because Crete was the last stronghold. Uh, Crete was the last stronghold of the goddess uh, cultures before the um, patriarchal way came into being. So this really came alive, and and the invocations I was doing in old temples meant that the the temple walls were really speaking to me. Uh, so I would really like to hear what they said. I don't want to slow you down from your flow, but um, so we might want to do this a little bit later down the road. But I would like uh, to understand um, what 
happened to the archetypes in this patriarchal journey in some great detail uh, and um, what you were informed about uh, as you tuned into that. In okay, the- we could veer off right now. Uh, uh, we were in Crete. I'll give an example. I mean, we were in Greece and Italy and Rome. I mean, there were a lot of places we were, but I'll give an example from Crete. And this Actually, this revelation might be shocking to some of your listeners. Uh, I was meditating at Knossos, which is the main site. I mean, Knossos was uh, a very advanced, I mean, a city of, I think, 20,000 people. It was the center of, I need to back up. I think most of your listeners may know that our prehistory was, mostly matrifocal. They were goddess-worshipping societies. And they were, they were tribal. The goddess uh, manifested as the earth. And there was a great reverence to the feminine. So this but, was most... Yeah, I, was but I would like to history. also go into that a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, because <laughs> a lot of people actually believe that, um, like when you talk about patriarchy, they say, well, yeah, men on top, before it was women on top, you know, what's the big deal? And uh, from my understanding, those uh, societies were actually more gender balanced. And exactly. they were that way at all. Um, so I don't know if that's appropriate to go into right now, and I don't want to throw your stream off terribly here, but... No, 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 no. <laughs> I, could, I can weave it in. I can weave it in. because I just wanted to establish the fact that for at least 20,000 years, we have in the archaeological record that pretty much worldwide, the uh, it was matrifocal, goddess-worshipping people. That's our that's our history, our history rather. And uh, these were tribal people. Now, tribal a tribal setup for society is the most stable uh, configuration that a society can be in. Why? Because everyone is working for the good of the tribe. Okay, so uh, then there was a a change. Uh, There's different theories about why things flipped. Joseph Campbell calls it the Great Reversal. He, He names the date 600 BCE as when things flipped from basic, Uh, this earth-centered descending current when I mean descending I mean looking toward the earth Uh, imminent divinity is imminent it means it's it's everywhere in nature it flipped to an ascending current which is our salvation is in heaven Um, it is the mind which will save us Uh, it's God the Father in heaven as opposed to uh, the Mother Earth. Well, this flip happened all over the world, and it's recorded in Europe. Some call it the Indo-Europe and India, Persia, all those areas. Some call it the um, Indo-European invasion, because what happened was the northern tribes came into the knowledge of metallurgy, harder metals, as in ability to make a sword. They lived in places where they killed animals. And so they had the technology. They also domesticated the horse first. So so they roared into these southern European and Indian uh, goddess-worshipping villages, agricultural villages, with uh, horse-driven chariots and the sword. And they uh, then conquered the goddess worshippers. And, of course, like any kind of invasion, any kind of conquering, then there's intermarriage and then there's, you know, there's, but there is a transition that happens with the, the cultural mixing of these two different cultures. And the result, which Joseph Campbell called the Great Reversal, was that life, the life view switched from Life is fair, life is abundant, the mother will take care of us. Two, life is suffering. I mean, that was the first point that the Buddha made. 
Um, and it's illusory, and we need to get out of it, and we will receive our reward in heaven. So, I mean, this is, these are diametrically opposed worldviews. Now, back to Crete. So, th- these invasions happen, and they sweep north to south. The last place to fall was Crete, because Crete was an island. So, it took them a while to get there. And uh, Crete was a matrifocal society. It was they were goddess worshippers. They had great tr- um, agricultural output, so so much so, surplus, right, abundance, that they could trade it. And since they were an island, they then became great seafarers, and their navy was well known. In the Egyptian court, the uh, the Minoan or, or uh, the pottery from Crete was all the rage. So they were high in the arts, high in architecture, agriculture, and and they were good mariners. So, uh, and Knossos was the capital city. It did not have fortifications. Up to a certain period, there were no weapons found in the, as the, the archaeologists did not find weapons until a certain period time after there was a like a volcanic explosion an earthquake and there were, began to be um, menace from the Mycenaeans who were some of these uh, ascending current god worshiping people then we get weapons but we we have a long record well over a thousand years maybe even 1700 years of a peaceful society <laughs> which that's why we had to go to Crete. I wanted to, James and I wanted to actually soak in the feeling of what if society were functional and supported everybody. And in the capital, there were large storage rooms for grain and all kinds of agricultural produce that would then be doled out to the people. And we know that because in the archaeological record, in the graves, they see that it doesn't matter if you were noble or or poor, the graves are pretty much the same. In other words, it's not, whereas later, like, the noble people are buried with gold and jewels and, you know, all kinds of riches. But in that time, everybody was working together for society. So we wanted to go there to, first of all, have a break from this doggy dog world where it's all predatorial or so it feels, to, to soak in what would have been like. And it was really monumental for us, especially James. He's an artist. And as he was beholding the Minoan art from ancient Crete, he, it just blew him away. It was so beautiful, so harmonious. You know, pictures of, of, people with their arms around each other, people dancing, fishermen bringing in the fish, mothers with babies at the breast, couples making love. Not like what you usually think of ancient Greek art, which is swords and stabbings and lances and and uh, horse-drawn chariots and blood and mayhem. So uh, I was, uh, we went to Knossos in the winter, because we like to go to places off-season, especially because I love to meditate and really feel, and it's hard to do that with 10,000 tourists around. So the day we went to Knossos, not only was it winter, it was raining. So we were like almost the only people there. And this is a place that receives thousands of visitors a day. So I was, I went down into a lower chamber of this, I mean, it's like a thousand-roomed palace. It's really incredible with, like, light wells and it had the first flushing toilet. I mean, this was an advanced civilization. And I'm sitting there and just, and I asked, I asked them, the, the Egyptians call them the Keftu. So I invoked them. I said, Keftu, what happened? What, you know, why have we gone so far away from what it seems that you achieved? And the answer I got was very interesting because I got a picture of what tribal people were. Tribal people who, the folk, if you imagine that tribes are set up on a circle with everyone looking at the center, 
that means that the common good is the top priority. And contrast that to a dominator culture, which we're living under right now, which is based on a pyramid, which is all the, the low, lower people serving the higher ups. And, you know, I think we're all familiar with there's all kinds of layers on that pyramid. Anyway, I got that image of everyone looking toward the center of their tribe. And that is what held it together. I also understood that something James had said when we were in the museum, when we were looking at the art, he says, you know, none of the artists signed their work. In other words, they didn't have a sense of individual identity. And I mean, and some of the work was like the gold work was just exquisite, unsigned. And that popped into my mind. It nagged at me. It's like no one signed their work. And then I, I recognized, wow, this is like a pre-egoic kind of awareness. It's before the ego has has gotten up on the throne. And I envisioned that evolution pushes so that when we're in the tribal way, which is everyone working for the common good, that evolution pushes us then to recognize ourselves as individuals. And all of us raised in... Um, we could call it Western thinking, value that very much. We value our individuality. We, I mean, I as a writer, I want to say I have something to say. And I attach myself to that. So what I saw was that, yes, there was the volcanic eruption. Yes, there was the earthquake. Yes, there was the the invasion from the north. But there was also a development that happened within the Minoan society where people started getting an individual identity and when you look at a tribe who's the first one that's going to take on that identity it's the warrior it's the warrior who has the strength and courage to stand up for his convictions and that and this is the warrior archetype a lot of times uh modern times we in like Iraqi soldiers or, you know, soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan or say, yeah, we're warriors. No, they're soldiers, they're cannon fodder. What the original, what the warrior archetype, the true archetype, is one who stands up for the greater good and defends it at risk to his or her life. So uh, I saw the warrior rising up in the Keftu or the Minoan civilization it was an inevitable push of evolution and that the next step after warrior of course is going into the mythic realm where some of those warrior impulses are corralled because you know obviously warriors can run amok and the mythic realm which is then what happened in greece and later in in the roman empire was um going back to this idea of the, the greater good and and letting the warrior, the individual, which allowed Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and all those guys to put out their ideas because they had confidence in themselves as individuals to have their own ideas, that the, the warrior would then um, put like a governor on his impulses to serve the greater good which is held together by the gods and goddesses so in crete i got the insight that and this was very important for me because before i was pretty much an eco feminist and if we get into like my stories about lilith and so forth i was angry (laughs) at the patriarchy i was able to forgive that anger within to let that anger within myself go to something more useful, which is compassion and understanding that it is the nature of evolution to push and that the and then it began to enter my awareness, which I had always denied. I mean I was pretty much in denial, done a lot of research, and sometimes in my research there would come up references to abuses by the uh, partnership cultures. And 
you know, that there were sacrifices to the goddess. And I was like, oh, no, that can't be true. But then I began to understand, well, actually, if in a tribal culture you sacrifice your individuality, it's only one more step if there's the, you know, annual young prince sacrifice to the goddess in actuality. Later it became sacrificing a bull or a goat, but a blood sacrifice nonetheless which from my sensibilities was barbaric, but I began to understand, well, maybe it was so. Maybe it was so. Maybe there were matriarchal elements. I mean, it was, we have evidence it looks like patriarchal, uh, I mean, it looks like partnership culture. Nonetheless, if there were matriarchal abuses, then there would have had to rise something to correct those abuses. So that was part of an insight that I got in my meditations in Crete that helped me then um, look at, I stopped using the word patriarchy and started using the term dominator culture because I realized that both men and women had uh, helped create the dominator culture and that still women and men are holding it up. And that helped me then see what was within myself that was still holding up the dominator culture, still holding that place in the pyramid so that the leaders up on top could keep preying on us. And what would you say those those qualities are, those shadow aspects are that keep us um, wanting that sort of uh, hierarchical authority even to our own demise? Well, uh, uh, now I could address any women in the audience. If we really take a look at how we as women hide our power, make it wrong, uh, or we're ashamed of it, or how, uh, how it comes out in unhealthy ways like manipulation or whining, those aspects which are culturally, I mean, they, that's what fits in the dominator culture for the woman to not come forth with her feminine gifts and neither the man, not for the man to come forth with his feminine gifts either. Because we, as long as we all stay in place in our little position in the pyramid, then it doesn't threaten the, the ones at, on the top. So within myself, I saw ways that I had silenced my voice, ways that I had not had confidence that I could, uh, you know, uh, act in a situation, ways in which I didn't stand up for the integrity of emotional feeling, that that it wasn't just all mental, which is okay, you know, the rational is okay. No, emotions too. And I, I think we as women in our culture and uh, find these parts of ourselves, especially in relationship. So this is why a focus of our project is that James and I were finding these roles that we were playing that uh, when we really looked at it, it's like, wait, I don't believe that. Why am I doing that? It's because I was raised that way, because our society says it's got to be that way. So, for example, the feminine erotic, which is in tantric tradition and in the ancient goddess cultures, the, the woman was the initiator. She was the initiatress. She's the one that uh, initiates uh, sexual contact that sets the pace because a woman's timing is, is much slower than a man's. And in Ancient cultures, tantric cultures, as well as goddess cultures, that was perfect. That was recognized. And there were temples. Why were, why were there more Venus temples than any other temple in the ancient world? Because they were temples of sexual initiation. And the sexual drive is a, is a big one. It's part of our life force. It's part of our expression of, of joy. So uh, another part, of the dominator culture is to, is to not express that. And in relationships, it's so funny um, when we think of ourselves as women, 
we may be pretty sexually liberated, pretty feminist thinking, but when we get in a relationship and we want to make love with our lover, we're going to wait on him. Well, you know, I don't want to be too bold or whatever, you know, which is, that isn't the feminine. The feminine is about life force and creativity and, and sexual expression. So those are some examples of ways that we make ourselves small and not okay in this culture because we're in a dominator culture that devalues feminine values. So I guess I'll pause a minute and see if we want to pick up on anything else or I can go on with our world odyssey. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, have a question. Do you feel that the archetypes live in us and have a reality that inform us that they are actually a living, breathing sort of subpersonality reality that uh, are at the root of a lot of these behaviors? In, in other words, they're templates. They're blueprints in the unconscious that we're patterning after and that through this epic that we are just transitioning out of, hopefully this patriarchal epic, that these uh, suppression of the feminine qualities are built in to the directives coming from this realm so that uh, we are all subject to a very powerful control grid that we can get it in touch with and that we can help to transmute. I mean, this is, you said this could be very dangerous, but I'm uh, saying, no, I think that now it's time for humanity to get, wow. Uh, I mean, you're the way shower of this. You're one of the key way showers right. I've met of James, Rebecca. You jumped in and got informed and felt the, the takeover of the patriarchy and the twistedness of all of this that just pushing on us. And you said, okay, and now it's a mind to transmute through art. It's a mind to transmute. And you took that on. And I'm seeing that now a, a greater portion of humanity can take that on. So uh, would you agree with that? That the power? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And I would say this. I have found in my experience that the archetypes are neutral. Uh, I, I, this is an important point. For example, I'm not going to say the warrior is bad. Uh, the warrior has, I mean, the warrior is who stands for truth and justice. I'm not going to say that Kali is bad, the goddess often associated with destruction, the Hindu goddess. She's the one that clears away the cuts away the rotten parts to or or kills what is sick so that something new can be born so the archetypes are neutral to the extent that they are unconscious and yes they all they are all playing in us all of them some of them have very minor roles some of them are really big roles depending on our personality what our dharma or our destiny is is which archetype is going to be stronger to the extent that they're unconscious in us, this is the key. And that's why the work you all are doing with Shadowland Voyagers is so important. Because to the extent that they're unconscious in us, that means they're these living forces within us. Now, if we use them, hooray, great, we, we are, have a life full of lots of energy. If we're not using them, they're not just going to lie around collecting dust. Somebody else is going to use them. Now, it might be a partner. If we're in a um, dis uh, dysfunctional or uh, masochistic, sadistic relationship, it might be the church. It might be society. It might be our parents. It might be some uh, pred predatorial energies that know that the archetypes are there, so they'll just sort of slip into their shoes while we're not looking and play them out and then use them to their advantage. So one of the big uh, quests that we found ourselves on with Venus and her lover was grabbing a hold of our identities. Many, we have, we have many of them. I mean, just like James had this 
large orientation to the warrior, but so do I. I've been an environmental activist, and you can't be uh, a wallflower. You know, if you're standing up to a corporate polluter, you got to pull up your warrior, which I did, and, that, and I do. So, but I had to have that warrior be conscious, or else when I am in um, grassroots organizing or dealing with, whether it's political or corporate um, adversaries, I have to have full control of my warrior or else they're going to use it against me. If I haven't brought parts of my warrior into awareness, the usually uh, it's natural, especially those who are good at it, they could trigger things in me so that I come out of reaction. Exactly. This is a huge thing, and I, I, we, we talk about this a lot on Shadowland Voyagers, how whatever we do not own and we're dissociated from is fodder for all the various dark ones. All right. Well, that was interesting. It's so interesting how these things happen. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have Rebecca and Christina back on the line. Yep. Rebecca, yep. you're there. We were talking about how the dark side utilizes these unowned energies, and I certainly uh, want to emphasize that again and again because there's a gigantic amount of power and sovereignty to be taken back as we own these, which has been your life work and we are so grateful for you doing that work for us all and beginning to come out here and share this. Um, so let's go back to a travel log. We have about 10 minutes to break. Why don't you pick it up with your travel log a bit, and we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, and I should say that, as I, as I said at the beginning, we were invoking archetypes unconsciously. And uh, while we were still in the Caribbean, uh, I had a tangle with two characters, Lilith and Kali, who are two archetypal characters, that really slapped us upside the head and said, pay attention. So um, along our journey, both James and I became more and more refined at discerning what forces were moving within us and what to listen to. I mean, that, I think, is what's very confusing for most people, myself included, uh, especially at the beginning, was how do I hear my inner voice, and how do I hear these other voices? How do I tell them apart? Well, yes. it became very important for us as we went along, because when, when I sold my house and property, and we sold our vehicles, and we basically sold out of our old life, we were... And, of course, we planned on investing, but that was at the time when uh, George Bush took office, the market crashed, and our our funds then started dwindling. But we still had enough for several years. It financed three years in Italy for us to devote ourselves totally to our work. And then I started dreaming about Hawaii, which it just popped in, started popping in dreams. And this was like a question of that discernment. Like, what is calling us? And uh, I always look for cor corroborating signs, and we then got the message that we needed to go to Hawaii. Now, for, for people who were trying to save and be frugal with their money, this would be like the last place on earth you'd want to go. But what we recognized was that in Hawaii, there is a goddess there named Pele. And anyone that's been to Hawaii and talked with any Hawaiians or even people living there, they refer to Pele like she's a living force. And they'll say, you know, well, Pele will test you and, you know, she'll decide if you can stay or not. And so we got this message that we were being called to Hawaii. And it's not surprising because according to a New Age view, the seven islands of the Hawaiian chain are, correspond to the chakras and the root chakra the connection to earth is on the big island and that's where we ended up so i think basically pele was saying to us well you're not going to write a book on first and second chakra issues if you don't come through my school <laughs> so <laughs> we moved 
<laughs> we moved across the world. Uh, and, and keep in mind, we're moving. Uh, each move is with a container. We're shipping my library and James's art. So we move across the world. It's the first time we'd been in the United States for many years. This was after 9-11. We got a very brutal welcome because, of course, we were suspect because we hadn't lived in the United States. Nonetheless, we set ourselves up in Hawaii, and it was, I mean, Pele put us through the ringer and made it very sweet and lovely, too. I mean, we were swimming with dolphins. You know, the beauty there is amazing. But I made pilgrimages to Kilauea, the Kilauea Crater, and offerings to that goddess because it's like, okay, this is raw earth. You know, I can see you're pretty uh, raw and rough, and there was just no bullshit with this goddess. And she, being um, in in that first chakra zone, really nailed us on our material connections and basically wiped out the rest of our finances there. <laughs> so we ended up, there's a chapter in our book, I call it Between Trapezes on Pele's Island. We were just suspended in mid midair, and to make things worse, we because we we needed to start hustling for money. Made a website. We did shows, promoting the art, and James did not paint a painting there, and I did not write a poem. It did not work. I was working on you know business prospectuses and not the creative writing. But I was, on a daily basis, I learned Hawaiian, some Hawaiian chants to really supplicate this force. And what was this force? It's about being incarnate. Pele is about being on earth. And how are your feet going to touch the ground? So it was wonderful and beautiful and terrible and scary, uh, our time there, until we ran out of money. Now, right on the verge of like, oh, well, now what do we do? We had just enough money to leave. Then suddenly James made an art sale that turned into eight art sales. But all of a sudden we had a bundle of money. So our friends, they were saying, oh, that means you can stay. But we realized that that had happened after we had, I actually went to the creator, I made offerings and thanked her for the very hard lessons and said, yes, I'm ready to go now. And it was after that that we were released from her classroom. Uh, a, a wonderful, terrible, you know, there's, a, there's a, an archetype, the terrible mother. And yes. that's my experience with Pele. <laughs> it's like she's going to give you the hard lessons because you need them. It doesn't matter if they hurt. So after that, we then I a bunch of synchronicities happened, and I got this vision of a Native American calling us because all of a sudden we had money. And then we had a family meeting. My, my son piped up and said, I've never lived in the United States. I mean, Hawaii doesn't really count. Um I'd like to live in the U.S. because he, he's a son of expats and wanted to know that country. So we then the signs started pointing. Okay, we're moving to the southwest. So we hit the California coast. We took our money, bought a van, and started just driving around and asking, is it here? Is it here? And we went to Sedona. We went to Santa Fe. Well, we ended up in Taos, New Mexico. And... That's where it hit me. When I look back on the project, I could see that this is a five-element work. And Tantra is the number five comes up in it. We had started in the Caribbean element of water. We went to Europe, to Italy, which was very intellectual element of air. Then we went to Hawaii, element of fire. Now we were in New Mexico with native peoples, element of earth. And that really grounded our project very much in the earth. It ended up the fifth element was India, we ended, the element of ether, and we ended up living in India after leaving New Mexico, but we were in New Mexico three years, and it was so wonderful for production. James finished all the paintings. I made a lot of progress on my writing. My son graduated from high school, which an American high school, which was his dream. 
got into an American college, also his dream. And then we got called to India, and that was really the reckoning about the whole tantric tradition, because one of the main streams of Tantra comes out of India. And there, we, our life there was full of paradoxes, as India is. It's about life and death. There were the goddess Shakti and Kali and Sarasvati and Durga, where goddesses are revered. The status of women is terrible. You know, wife burning still happens, throwing acid on women's faces, rape as a right. The abuse of women is still happening there. And so we went in depth there to, at the birthplace of Tantra, one of the birthplaces of Tantra, to uh, really immerse the project in its philosophical and spiritual tradition and look at what is happening there. And, of course, I write about all this. In the memoir, it's the story of the meditation in Crete, the amazing events with the whales in the Caribbean and the Native American ceremonies in the Southwest and the connection with Pele and the spiritual practices in India. All of that I tell in the, in the memoir on how we got familiar with the archetypes within us and the collective archetypes. Because we are all part of a collective consciousness. That's what Jung was referring to. And those archetypes run according to how we feed them, our interpretation of them. Because remember, my opinion is that archetypes are neutral, and how we're going to use them is up to us. Yes, that's so, so important, because uh, there's so much talk about us being co-creators, that we are creator gods and goddesses in the making, uh, beings, uh, universal creators of light. And there's this whole palette, there's this whole artistry in a realm of archetypal reality that is ready for us to command, transmute, transform, co-create, and we're not listening. And this is the, the greatness that you bring uh, in that you were listening. And people are so frightened now as the old paradigm crumbles. How do I navigate my life through this new reality? So I just think that you make an incredible role model because you weren't listening to ego, to fear, to old trauma-based patterns, to any of that. You were listening to life itself. This huge, gorgeous, and incredibly challenging drama unfolded. You didn't back away from the pain. You kept on it, and you ended up individuating and transmuting energies and having an incredible life in the process. And it's that's so, an incredible life. And that's the joy and the beauty. And it's like, yay, this is why we're here. It's for the pleasure. Amen. All right, we're going to go to break now. That's our one. We'll be back with our two, Venus and her lover. Stay with us. Welcome back, Shadowland Voyagers. This is hour two with uh, a beautiful Rebecca, who I know by another last name. So tell me your last name. I'm going Rebecca blank. Rebecca Sagani. Rebecca Sagani. And uh, tell us your website, Rebecca. How do we get yes. in touch with this amazing work? Let's start with that and end with it this hour. We have a very full website, lots of excerpts, lots of art, erotic art at www.venus, like the goddess, venusandherlover.com. And you can get in touch with us through our website. And we also have a Facebook page. And if you fan or become a friend of our 
Facebook page. Uh, we're always posting uh, not just our work, but what other people in the world of Tantra and sexuality and psychology and history and mythology and archetypal psychology and integral thought are doing. So it's like a good uh, base from which to understand our work. Beautiful. Well, we have uh, one more hour, and I am very interested in you diving deep uh, for us all to experience with you. Uh, your journey, perhaps we talked about your experience with Lilith as a hands-on example of how one works with uh, archetypal realities. Are, is, unless there's somewhere else you want to go or you're feeling completely... No, no, that's good. That's okay. good. That's good. All right. Uh, oh, yes. Lilith. <laughs> Lilith, and I have to preface, it, preface this by saying that Lilith was... We tangled with this archetype really uh, in the first year and a half of our project when we were greenhorns and she really told, she really showed us the respect you must have for archetypes because we invoked her unconsciously and uh, so she appeared and this is how it happened. Uh, we were, it was right at, like I said, right after the first year, James was doing uh, erotic paintings of us. I was getting awesome messages in the poetry. And then uh, we did an art tour on the California coast, and several people showed up and wanted to be part of the project. So we felt like, oh, that was another boundary pusher. But okay, yes, we did photo shoots with other people. Then we all of a sudden had other people in our work. And then, well, who are they? <laughs> well, one of them was Lilith. And I'm going to back up a step and give some history of the myth of Lilith for those who don't know. Yes, please. Now, myth, um, Lilith is a monumental character in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is what our Western world is based on. And many people don't know about her. Why? Because... She was there and then taken away. So when you read Genesis in the Bible, uh, there's a story about the Elohim. It says, let's create man and woman in our image. So they take some clay and they fashion it into a man and a woman. Okay. And they say, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. Well, then uh, about a chapter and a half later, you read that Adam is complaining to God about being lonely, and God makes a sleep fall upon Adam, takes out a rib, and creates Eve. Now, that's two stories <laughs> that conflict. So what uh, we know the Eve story. What was that first one? Well, that first one was Lilith, and they essentially expurgated. They took out Lilith from the Bible, why they left in that beginning with the Elohim, I don't know, but all the interim was taken out. And here is the interim story, because it uh, appears in the Torah. That's how we know. Uh, and Lilith was probably originally a Sumero-Babylonian goddess that was incorporated in the Hebrew tradition, because Adam and Lilith were first man and first woman. And they named the animals and so forth. Then one day, Adam commands Lilith to lie beneath him to make love. And Lilith says, well, no, I don't need to be beneath you because God created or the Elohim created us equally out of the same mud. So we're equals. And Adam said, no, woman, you lie beneath me. And she said, forget it. I'm out of here. So she flies off to the Red Sea. She cavorts with spirits and demons and gives birth to a hundred beings a day. Because, I mean, her tradition was an earth mother. So, of course, she was very fecund, very fertile. She could create beings. Then Adam, of course, is left alone. God sends the angels after Lilith to bring her back. And she's like, screw you guys. I'd rather be on my own. And so that's why Adam got lonely and asked God to make a 
more docile woman, and then he made Eve. Now, this is very important for the psyche of woman in our society, because on the one hand, you have Lilith, who is an independent, sexually liberated woman. On the other hand, you have Eve, who is mother, obedient, helpmate. And in our society, we know traditionally which one worked. <laughs> I mean, for, for basically the past 2,000 years or longer, 2,500 years, it's only the Eve model of woman that was allowed. So this Lilith had to go underground, and actually that's what happened to her. Even though her story remained in the Torah, she then became like a boogie lady. And they said, whereas she had been an earth mother who was very fertile and created many children, now she became a night hag. They said she had the feet and wings of an owl, and she'd swoop in at night, and she would cause men to have wet dreams and nocturnal emissions and then steal the semen and inseminate herself. And she, and she had other feminine demons who did this. And they, who were called the harlots of hell. So you can see what's getting tangled up here is woman's sexuality and women, woman's independence and being called evil. And any of us who've had to get up our courage to be an independent woman know that we have to call up those Lilith powers which are frowned upon. I mean, until the 70s in the feminist movement, it was Eve all the way, the Eve archetype. Okay, so we decide or we get the idea somehow that one of the characters in our work was Lilith, and I didn't know anything about her. So the original work, the first painting that he did was called Daughters of Lilith. It was a, of a group of women dancing in a a grove in nature at night. It's when the feminine had to go underground during the reign of the dominator culture. So in my studies, I started reading about what happened while the feminine was underground, and I read about the Inquisition. Now, this became then a personal torture chamber because I, I mean, I'd heard about it in history, but I never studied it. I didn't know that it was mainly, a, well, I'd say a property grab to get, the, you know, the, the property and power out of women. But then I was reading about, the, I read the Malleus Maleficarum, which was uh, written in the 15th century. It was basically a torture manual for women. And, you know, read about how they were raped and their legs broken and bamboo shoots under the fingernails and prolonged torture of women, and then burned at the stake. I became so grief-stricken that I, I got sick. My lungs filled with fluid. I was sick for a month and a half. I was angry at James, which, I mean, we were lovers. We love each other. But I just, you know, the whole, I got angry at men. James started feeling guilty. He started talking about the father is a failure. I mean, we were in a hell because what was happening was that we were finally letting in the feelings of what 500 years of torture of people, not just women, but mostly women, witches, so-called witches, did to humanity. I had that memory in my cells, and so did he, and we were grieving. So he's, you know, stumbling through painting. He's Right, he's doing paintings. I can't write a word. I have a writer's block. I am just, I'm crying during the day. I mean, I'm a mess. And I'm feeling that pain. And then at one point, I even have a, an image of my yoni being gored with a sword. So I was feeling it within me through and through. Then it gets to, you know. Can I ask you, yeah. I just would like to interject something here. Because it's been my experience and uh, working with uh, many women over the uh, years that uh, this collective memory, this archetypal memory that also goes into the core of Sophia Gaia and is the memory that's stored in the feminine template, the feminine, however you want to say that, is 
is such a log jam, is, is such a in, infection that has not sutured and drained, that it informs so much of the disempowerment. I'm, I've been in so many sessions with women who try to retrieve their female essence, for example, that hit upon this torture. And, and it is so deep in the uh, trauma-based mind control that if they ever – decide to manifest, not just as a man manifest power, but as a woman manifest with the real energy of the feminine. This trauma is there so profoundly that most of them just cave back in and go back into uh, operating from more of a male model of running energy. And so it seems to me that as you do this work, you are draining the wound for uh, the feminine, and I mean the earth, I mean galactic center, I mean the archetypal and, I, uh, and the uh, collective unconscious of women because it is so uh, impactful that the, the, the whole idea of the return of the feminine and this time is, um, is being crippled by this kind of trauma. So people like you that have taken it on, I just want to kind of contextualize it. I feel that you're doing that for the race as well, and you're doing it for the earth, and that, that she's asking for this participation and you're listening. And even though it's also exceedingly personal, there's a much bigger dynamic operating and as you're moving through this. And I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. And my first tangle with it was with Lilith. And it's not to say like, okay, we went through the little thing. We're glad we dispensed with that. No, I mean, it still comes up in waves and needs to be processed. And that's, <laughs> that's what I do. The way you described it would make it sound like no one would want to take this on. But I would like to say that it is so liberating to do that because all the energy bound up in that trauma, we can claim. And I'm not saying I've gone all the way through it, but I am describing my, my first experience with it. And it was indeed terrifying to realize that this had not only had gone on, but if it wouldn't, it wouldn't have felt so cutting if it weren't still going on. You know, it's the same. Yes. The same dynamic of terrifying people into submission. So this goes on for about six weeks. I'm sick. I can't write. And the paintings in the meantime are stacking up in, in, in my bedroom, right? I had, a, I had a real tall wall. We got up to four paintings and one, and I'm not writing a thing. A definite writer's block. And James comes home one evening with the drawing of a fifth painting. And we're looking at them, and he all of a sudden says, wait a minute. And he rearranges the order of the paintings. And then it, the light bulb went on. What we had there was a new myth of Lilith told in five segments. And all of a sudden, I, I mean, I got it. And I, I wrote those five poems like, boom, because it was a story. And here's how the story went. In the first piece, there's two women facing one another in a cosmic egg, and it's Eve and Lilith. It's right at that moment of duality where the feminine is split. And, of course, that split becomes schizophrenia in women <laughs> in our 3D reality. But archetypally, that's what we depict, those two sides where they're both smiling at each other, like, yeah, we're two sides of one whole. Then the next piece is the Daughters of Lilith, where the women must hide in the darkness to be able to celebrate the feminine force. And a crone is there. So it's a crone passing wisdom to the maiden. Because we have, you know, the threefold archetypal feminine is maiden, mother, crone. And the man is there, which is, that's part of the healing of the myth, that uh, the man can be, now can be included. The masculine can also be included in this. And then the third piece is called Redemption of Adam. And it takes place in Venus's temple. And there's a painting that he painted was of Adam lying on his back with Lilith on top. <laughs> it's 
like, yay, he finally gets it. <laughs> so much more pleasurable that way. And then Bacchus is there and Venus is there and there's like a Dakini there playing music. And so it's like the finally the consummation of Adam and Lilith at peace again, for having forgiven one another and making love again. And then the, oh no, I'm sorry, I skipped one piece, that before the redemption of Adam, there's a, a piece, of a painting that he had painted, which was, we're looking at it, and like, okay, there's Lilith, there's Eve, there's, and we realize there's Mars and Lilith and Venus. And he had painted it, where they're seated together in erotic, essential position underneath an apple tree with a snake in the tree. Now, he just painted this just, you know, painting it. But when we looked at it, we're like, that's an apple tree. That's, that's the Garden of Eden. So there was Lilith in the Garden of Eden. She had come back and everyone else had gotten thrown out. So uh, Venus and Mars go to her and say, look, Let's go get Adam. We have to redeem man now. Let's bring Lilith back into the fold with Eve, and then let's go get Adam and love him. And then comes the redemption of Adam, and then the fifth piece is called Sanctuary, and it's where Lilith, it, James painted it within a church. <laughs> so there's a picture of Lilith and Eve and Adam, or Adam slash Mars, Eve slash Venus, all together embracing one another. So the man embraces the the two sides of woman, the the women embrace the masculine, so the healing is complete. Some of these pieces are on our website. And going through that process, what I felt from Lilith was it you know, for those six weeks that I was sick, she was like screaming. She was like clawing at me like a person who's drowning like tell my story and uh that's why i had to get informed about the inquisition get informed about what had happened to the feminine going underground for all those years so that i could tell her story and then bring it into a healing and at the end it had been like i had been under a, a heat lamp for six weeks you know like this intense beam of uh, a force field of some kind that was insisting that I feel the feelings and learn what had happened. And as soon as I wrote the sanctuary poem, the last, the fifth piece, it's like it was all lifted. In other words, I felt like the healing had happened. So she wanted you to help her experience it, know the truth of it, see every aspect of it, and then you rewrote it. Right. Exactly. And, and this is the huge power that we have as a human race, both in our personal and collective unconscious. And Steve Richard talks about this, that they, they go back and release all of, all of the demons and the trauma-based mind control and everything that happened, and then they rewrite it. And another story is then in that place. And this is what actually exactly. you're, you're doing in your work. You're rewriting the myth. And this is what we, can, we all must do now. Because we go back to the root cause of where the story uh, was one of torture and suppression, and we change the words because the words create a different reality. Literally, if we've gone through the shadow land of making it all conscious, then all the energy is up for the rewrite. If we try to overjump it and create a nice, pretty story, all of that stuff is rumbling around, begging to be expressed, and, and we're not getting a complete transmutation. Is, is that been your experience? That's exactly it, and I'm so grateful for that experience. I feel like I had blinders on my eyes before as a, as a human being, not ever having been in a position to feel what that was, to then be able to stand up and say, uh-uh, no, it, our reality is not like that. We are beings that can enjoy pleasure, not just pain. And then to rewrite it, I mean, literally, we rewrite and then re-depict because it's an art and poetry project. So it's like a highfalutin comic book <laughs> that you can look at the new story. 
Are we going to get to like hear it. even one poem, perhaps, today of yours? Yeah, we could. You know, maybe I will read uh, the sanctuary poem. Uh, so I'm going to pull yeah. that up. And while I do, I'd li- I also like to digress for a moment and talk a minute about Eve. <laughs> because Eve is such uh, oh boy, she, okay, so she's the woman figure that was allowed to live, right? Lilith was, they tried to erase her. They just put her into the night hag, scary, boogie lady category. But Eve was the socially acceptable woman. So Eve gets carried forward into our reality, into our society. And let's see, when was this? This was Um, So many centuries later, we come into when the church, the Roman Empire has fallen, and the church is just gathering its power, the Christian church, which would become the Catholic church. And there's an up-and-coming bishop. He was the Bishop of Hippo in, like, Algeria, I think, and then he goes to Rome and then Milano. And he was at the right place at the right time, and this guy's name is Augustine. Now, when he lived in North Africa, he was pretty much a profligate. I mean, he screwed around a lot. You know, he was a ladies' man. He got a woman pregnant. He had a kid. And his mother, whose name was Monica, was heartbroken that her son was such a a Don Juan and just spending all of his energy and money. So she converts him to Christianity. Then he becomes a devotee, a priest, rises in the ranks, becomes a bishop. He ends up in Milano. And he was a brilliant man, very, very smart. And he writes a lot about the transcendence of the soul. I mean, a lot of the guts of Christian thought comes out of Augustine. And I'm not going to totally badmouth the guy. He was a brilliant man. But one of the things he came up with, was an interpretation of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And he's the one that said that Eve, that the transgression, aside from curiosity, like that she wanted to take the apple from the snake, and aside from disobedience, that she had been told not to, is that she used her sexual wiles to convince Adam to sin. So when they took the apple, according to the myth, Uh, the knowledge of good and evil or the knowledge, the tree of recognition and their eyes are opened and all of a sudden they see that they're naked and they're ashamed. Now, where are these ideas coming from, right? (laughs) Okay. And they're ashamed and then God punishes them, throws them out of the garden of Eden and it's all Eve's fault. And what God says to Eve, of course, is, well, you're the one that tempted Adam. And this is a Lilith characteristic, having the power to sway a man through seductiveness and because of that now you are going to feel pain the pain of childbirth and now man is going to have to labor to live and you know labor in the field in other words not only are you condemned but all your children are condemned therefore augustine says that we are all born with the sin of eve now condemning all of humanity And throwing that on a woman is what then molded thought for the next 1,500 years. To the point where I think Thomas Aquinas said, woman is just a flower pot for the seed of man. You know, she's just to gestate a real human being. But you see, this this is a worldwide idea. Why are they burning women in India? Why did the Chinese kill the, you know, why is there feminine infanticide in China and India? Because a woman is less. Now, they didn't know anything about the myth of Adam and Eve, but it became a dominant thought form on the planet. And we can thank Augustine for that, for interpreting the Garden of Eden fiasco as all Eve's fault. And I read, uh, Augustine wrote a book called Confessions. So I understood, like, oh, my God, this is a sexually repressed man who feels guilty for his earlier profligate life. He abandoned the the mother of his child and his child. 
And he's put, he's projecting that guilt outward into church dogma, which then became the basis not only for church laws, but for civil laws. So this whole Eve Lilith split became monumental in how our identities as men and women and the guilt that was thrown upon women as the the tempters of man. Yes. It's so <laughs> we recognize history. Most people feel that uh, you know, since uh, the 60s and feminine liberation that uh, women have equality uh, largely in, in Western culture. But these archetypes are still informing our reality. And then we've not dive into and do all the dark side interventions to guard uh, these manipulations. But it allowed all of this juicy energy to be held in unconscious, where it's been fed off of by what you want to call archontic forces, reptilians, uh, all, all of that. Uh, there was a, an interdimensional maneuver, and these were the uh, figures on the chessboard that were moved around. Uh, but if we don't know what happened, and that these are still uh, polluted forces in a type of reality that's forming our moment by moment reality, we are not going to be able to pull ourselves through that shadow land into our sovereignty. Certainly, uh, people like you have been purifying these archetypes, but uh, I think more of us need to step up to the plate, at least in bringing this into our awareness. So I thank you very much for this information. Well, I would say purify, like I said, I believe archetypes are neutral. I'm simply owning the archetype and putting the interpretation on it that is most life affirming from my perspective right now. And that's what we each can do. Wherever level we're at, we can grab hold of the Lilith archetype or the Eve archetype within us and put it on our terms, how we want to live it and not what's been handed to us. So I, I could read a poem if you'd like. I think that would be fabulous. Okay, so this is called Sanctuary. It's the fifth piece in the five-piece Lilith series. Sanctuary. I know you are here, Lilith, by the way cool moonlight chases the shadows in my rooms and incense smoke snakes around, hypnotizing me. I pray for strength to stand in the world and you slip in. As Nimue enticed Merlin into the crystal cave, so you carried forward the shimmera of fully woman for me and my sisters to step into at this turn of the wheel. You rode moonbeams and men's erotic fantasies sideways between dreams far too long. Now my memory is restored and I will not sleep another night until yours is too. Come in, great goddess, inside. We bathe in the warm light of the lover, the mother, and the maiden of ideas, and fully man embraces us all. Our resplendent aura grows. Slithering down from the tree of recognition, the serpent encircles us with love and whispers secrets of the earth womb our home. Stay, dear Lilith, in this basilica of harmony restored, setting altars in every woman's heart, lighting candles in every man's eyes. Here, sovereign angel of truth, in your sanctuary, never again to be exiled. Oh, beautiful. I want more poems. <laughs> We have about a half hour left, <laughs> Becca. So um, I don't know if you want to take on another goddess or if we have enough time for that. We could speak a bit about Kali. That might be very appropriate. <laughs> we're, we're getting all the heavy hitters. <laughs> well, it's that moment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Does that sound good? Sounds great to me. Okay. So often archetypes come in threes. For example, there's the triple goddess, maiden mother crone. And in the Hindu pantheon, the gods and goddesses, the prime ones, come in Trimurti or Holy Trinity, which is creator, sustainer, and destroyer. For the masculine, 
the creator is Brahman, the sustainer is Vishnu, and the destroyer is Shiva. For the feminine, Kali is actually a triple goddess. She's three in one, though her different aspects have been named as the creatress is Sarasvati, the sustainer is Lakshmi, and the destroyer is Kali. Now, her destroyer aspect has become really popular in the last century since, like, uh, Ramakrishna and those guys, the Bengali poets, did a revival of Kali uh, in India, who had been pretty much, I would say, suppressed or ignored when the British Empire was in India because this goddess, many, many of you I'm sure have seen her, she is usually depicted, she's got black skin, She's got a um, necklace of skulls and a belt of arms, and she's squatting over Shiva, her lover, uh, as if she's ready to have him enter her. Uh, she's half naked. I mean, she's the terrible mother, right? Yes. Archetype. And I, I think the reason that she's gained a lot of popularity lately is because Many believe that we are in the Kali Yuga, and there are all kinds of different prophetic traditions that name the different ages that we're in, you know, the Golden Age, the Bronze Age, yada, yada, that now we're in the, oh, the Iron Age, and et cetera, that the Kali Yuga is the last age before the, the wheel turns again. And so the last age means it's the time when things are most degenerate where they say the, that ignorance sits on the throne. And, I mean, I just have to look at the news any day of the week and see that that is so. Definitely. <laughs> we are definitely in degenerate times. Ignorance is definitely on the throne. It looks like this is pretty much the end of the line, and many – People feel it. I actually believe that everyone feels it. It's just that it's hard to face. So people either numb out with either drugs or addictions or entertainment or go into total denial. Or everything is just sweet and wonderful and hunky-dory because we are at a, a time, in, from my view, where this reign, this paradigm is coming to an end. Now, who presides over that? There's an archetype that presides over that, the goddess Kali. And she is the one that instructs us on how to get through this. It's interesting reading a lot of the Bengali poetry uh, for the Kali temples there. The, the poems are of adoration. I mean, they're beautiful poems. Because what they recognize, these poets in Kali, is that she was also the creatress. There's a creation myth that says that she created the world with the word. In the beginning was the word. We have that in the Christian tradition. And that she's the one that also manifests time. So if we're going to have a 3D reality, we need time and space. <laughs> for us to play it out. And from the Hindu perspective, there's Shakti, the feminine force, Shiva, the masculine force. Shiva is the realm of consciousness, awareness. We could call that the all, the, the all-knowing, the one, the, where, where everything's just an idea. But when it comes into manifestation, that's where we use the feminine force, which is Shakti, the Shakti force. Shakti means power means power to manifest, and Kali, as a, the manifestation of the Shakti force, manifests our 3D reality with time. So she's the one that we can turn to when we look at the wheel of time and say, okay, it's spinning around, we're in this time where everything is falling apart, what do we do? And, of course, what Kali is telling us to do is... <laughs> Well, from my perspective, she's saying, look where it all comes from. Where did all this manifestation come from? And in a word, it's archetypes. What are these archetypal forces? And how do you want to embody them? Because right now, 
all the abdicated parts of ourselves, all those archetypal placeholders within us that we're not using that have been grabbed a hold of by some forces, she's saying, okay, now's the time of reckoning because you guys, you predatorial guys, are actually taking more than your share. So now it's time for people, they can, we can either wake up and claim what the life force is and how we can play in this world of manifestation. There's a term in Sanskrit called lila, that this world is lila. I mean, when you think about it, why would the all-seeing, all-knowing consciousness or Shiva want to create just a world of pain, suffering, injustice, and horrors. No, it is one aspect, but only from a certain perspective. And second of all, there's another aspect, which is Leela, play, enjoyment. We're in bodies to enjoy ourselves in bodies, which then brings in the tantric perspective that we're in bodies. Let's use them and let's explore what our pleasure is. So Kali is, is saying, take a hold of that. You know, who are you? Are you just an empty shell? No. You have the capacity to be the infinite all. And you can't postpone doing that anymore. Now's the time when you have to claim it because all the unclaimed energies are running rampant. And that's all misplaced energies. So if we don't, then all those misplaced energies will then destroy themselves. And that's what I think we're seeing. We're seeing a great destructive cycle, which Kali says, if it ain't right, we're going to burn it down. Either you take care of your house or we're going to burn down the house. <laughs> and, and then, you know, build it up with consciousness. Build it up with awareness. How do you want to manifest in the world? We're in the Kali Yuga. We can feel into her by going into this blackness, this feeling of the dark comfort of earth, the, the descending current, imminence, the depths, shadows, to balance the light of consciousness, the heavenly transcendence, the creative love and light. We are both things. And uh, Kali's asking us to put things back in balance. So in my personal experience with Kali, she definitely, she, one of her weapons is a sword, it's a sword of discernment. And she really put me up against the wall with that blade at my throat and said, okay, you have shadows in your sexuality, and that's why you feel called to throw your sexuality out here in a public way, which, by the way, I, I can't believe sometimes that I'm doing that, but anyway my destiny uh so you've got to face your shadows and so she's been taking me on a, it's an ongoing journey of where my genital armoring is like where i protect myself what's happening in the sacral area which by the way the sacrum is the sacred bone right the triangular shaped bone the seat of our sexuality and most of us, especially women, hide our deepest, darkest secrets there because we don't want to go there. Not fully. And so my journey with Kali has been going into sexual shadows, going into my a lot of my feminine attributes that I didn't want to bring online, and the expression, like the exuberant expression of life force, which doesn't, is not supposed to be bottled up. It's not supposed to be squirreled away at some dark, dusty corner of my sacrum. No, the creative force is supposed to come through in my art, in the beauty that I can help create every day. So it ha I write about this in the memoir, the ride I've been on with Kali. It's not like it, like Lilith was a, an intensive. Kali has been calling me on my shit making me look at things I didn't want to look at because she's saying, look, you have to be balanced to step into the new age. You can't leave parts of yourself behind. And I think that's what's called, what Kali is saying to all of us. I think most people go into denial about it. 
And it, it, now that I think about it, we've talked about Kali, Pele, and Lila, who are the real heavy ladies in the archetypal pantheon. Uh, but what she's helping me do is bring my Venus to life, who is the, the lover, the patroness of the arts, the one who beholds a flower, the one where she steps roses bloom, the one who has a force of gravity that, that encourages people and animals to fall in love and mate. That Venus, I mean, it's the title of our work, right? Venus and her lover. Venus, for her to come fully online, I have to cultivate a relationship with, with Kali because she's the one that's showing me where I'm holding back, what I'm afraid to manifest as a Venus is the full feminine expression. Kali is the one who's helping me see what's stopping Venus. Because in a world with so much strife and so much suspicion and fear, we need Venus. We need Venus big time. We need people to trust. Not the sexy, coy, manipulative Venus. No. The new Venus, the Venus who is loving and compassionate and gentle and caring. The Venus that will embrace us and where we can really feel cared for and at home. Uh, I feel like, yeah, I have to talk a little about Venus because I don't want people to think that archetypes is just all shadow land. <laughs> it's going through the shadow land to more brightly shine our light, to more brightly manifest the infinite capacity we have with our consciousness that's, and we can do th- yeah we can do that in through the, the shadow land i mean it's it's not a, a perpetual um what do you call it the those horror rides at disney world like, just for the sake of it no it's it's the way through it's the birth canal so i'm really glad you brought that up absolutely in the time we have remaining, um, about five minutes here, your your uh, closing thoughts on patriarchy, on where we are at the moment. Uh, you know, there's so much talk about: uh, is it over? Is it the powers that were, the powers that thought they are, the powers that be, the powers that wish they'd be? Or are we all deluding ourselves, and they're very much still the powers that be? Yeah. Um, well, I, personally, I do feel like it is the end of the line because Kali's presiding right now. So they're on their way out and they're going to fight to the death, I think. And as I mentioned earlier, I've taken uh, from ta- referring to it as patriarchy to the calling it the dominator system or the dominator culture, yeah. because I feel find that by calling it the dominator system, I realize that I have a place in it. And that takes me away from the victim position to actually a place where I can root out the dominator paradigm within myself. There are ways that I kowtow. There are ways that I say, yes, sir. And that's what I have a power to change. So it just so happens that because of the evolution, the way it went, that it is largely ruled by men. But women, it would not be if women weren't holding it in place. We're the placeholders. And so we can dismantle patriarchy or the dominator system within ourselves. This is so empowering to me. It's one of the things that gives me strength every day because I can work on that every day. I can find those places within myself and transmute them and bring online the balance that I feel the earth is saying, yes, it's time. And I think she's calling all hands on deck. It's not time to shrink. It's not time to go, well, I don't know. No, no. We, whatever we've got in our healing process, we step forward with it. Because the dominator system is built as a pyramid, the bottom rungs are vital. They have to stay in place, guys and gals on top, to, to keep their position. If we desert our posts, they will fall. And we, we can do that in a daily practice, even with the breath of empowering 
the beauty, the life, the giving, the kindness, the trust, the, the justice, the joy within us. We can do that breath by breath, and that is taking the pyramid apart plank by plank. And that's something we each can do. You've been on such a unique and fascinating journey. It's been so interesting to me to listen and just the wisdom that comes through you and the presence and the groundedness um, in your energy. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm talking about my favorite topic. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Rebecca, in the moments we have remaining, um, tell us something about the pillow deck, a tantric oracle and erotic card game that they can purchase off your website, right? Yes. Uh, go to venusunderlover.com and uh, go. There's a the pillow deck is right there on the home page, and you can check it out. What happened while we were living in Italy? We became friends with an Italian mystic who got an inspiration about the imagery that James had painted and reinterpreted them as a. Uh, he's a tarot reader also and a palm reader. He's, he's a mystic. And so he reinterpreted the imagery as an oracle deck, which we then had printed. He and I worked on the um, text of it. James worked on getting the imagery into cards. We printed them in Italy. And because the imagery from the paintings is real people, I think that they have an energy uh, that is very true. Uh, one thing that Rocco Jacopini, this Italian mystic, says is, Funzione, funzione. He says it functions. They work. If you are uh, have questions about relationship, about your inner masculine and feminine, what you know, how to work out this play of energies, the uh, the pillow deck is there for your consultation, and we do sell it off our website. And James, I invite uh, you all to hop on over to venuscenterlover.com. James always says, buckle your seatbelt, because we tell these tales of our journey of invoking archetypes, of balancing the masculine and feminine within us and in our relationship, and how to maintain a balanced relationship over the years through all kinds of trials, tribulations, joys, and pleasures. Hmm. How long have you been together? We've been together 14, 15 years. Woo. Yeah. yeah. But you've definitely have yeah, gone through a lot together. And would you say you've grown, I mean, you were stronger than ever, closer, more balanced through all of these child and tribulations that you've gone through? Yes. I would say we have gotten to a place of like real peace and love. Mm. And keeping in mind that he's a warrior and I have a strong warrior too, but that we're opposites. You know, Venus and Mars are opposites and we are opposites. So, you know, like when he belches at the table and I cringe and, you know, (laughs) Uh, but all of that, I'm so grateful that in my life I came across someone who would challenge me Mm -hmm. and call up the parts I didn't want to see, as I do for him. And it has engendered a great love, just as the myth, Venus and and uh, Venus and Mars had a legendary love affair that, uh, well, comes down to us to this day. So important. And I want to thank you all for doing the work you do. Uh, as you can tell from the stories I tell about the heavy-hitting goddesses, uh, working with the shadow is crucial for us to become truly free beings. Mm, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Sienna. And onward, we have all have <laughs> lots of work to do to, to birth this golden age through us. Absolutely. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Please join us again next week on Shadowland Voyagers.